if you have your Bibles with you this morning, we ask you to turn to book to First Samuel, book of First Samuel. We're going to begin reading in verse seven, uh, chapter seventeen, verse forty-three. First Samuel seventeen, and we're going to begin reading in verse forty-three. Uh, uh, fairly familiar verses of scripture, but I think uh, we forget it very frequently. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17, beginning in verse 43, the Bible says, And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with, with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I, and I will give thy flesh to the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee unto my hand, and I will smite thee, and I will take thine head from thee, and I will give thee the carcass of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the, and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this, and all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give it unto our hands. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead. And the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your goodness and your watch care. We thank you for the church at Dover. Lord, we thank you uh, for the things you've allowed to accomplish through the ministry here at Dover. We pray for... Uh, the new work at Paris, for we know now comes the time of testing. Lord, we pray that you would strengthen those people together uh, in the days that are ahead. Bless and honor now your word. We'll be faithful to give you the praise for it, for it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, very familiar verses of Scripture, how that David honored, uh, how the Lord God honored David with an impossible victory. Uh, often we uh, want this type of victory, but the, the episodes e leading up, the time leading up to that victory is often a discouragement, and we never get in the position of victor. Now, I understand the Bible is very clear that uh, the victory comes from the Almighty and from the Lord God, but I tell you what's last, lacking in the modern day is trust and faith on our behalf. Uh, on our behalf, there's not trust to win victories like there once was. When you look about and you see what's going on in the world, what you find is discouragement. But the, the man of God and the church of God ought to live in victory. Every day, whether there's seven of you or 1,700 of you, there's a place of victory. And we don't claim it. Uh, we, we'll find that the lad David, the reason he enjoyed this is because he claimed the victory before it ever happened. And how did he do that? He had confidence in the Lord God. Uh, when you think about the people that you desire the Lord might save, have confidence that God will do it. Have, have, pray, but never give up praying on one thing because our God is able. Uh, you know, I find that probably the majority of the people's prayer life in a church isn't nearly where it ought to be. Prayer takes time. Uh, prayer takes effort. Uh, prayer takes sincerity. You know, a lot of times, and I believe mean, it's a good thing that we do it, but when we ask to be prayed, to ask in a public service to pray, it ought to be with sincerity. 
You know, the Bible has a lot to say about vain repetitions. Uh, and we immediately point to the Catholic Church, and certainly that's the truth. But you know what? I find myself saying the same thing over and over again as well, don't you? And, and, and so we find that uh, victory does not come by sitting idly. Uh, victory does not come from just hanging out. Victory does not come by simply looking at circumstance. And so we as the Lord's people, we need to understand and know if we're going to enjoy a great victory, we have to be prepared for it. Now, if you will go back to uh, verse 34 and we're going a little further back to see what led up to this great and wonderful victory that, uh, that David did enjoy on this day. Uh, in verse 34, the Bible says, And David said unto Saul, now, I want you to be reminded one more time, just a little further back, that David was already obedient to his father. Uh, young people, the best thing you can do is be obedient to your father. This whole, this whole excerpt is really about obedience. And if you remember, Jesse said, uh, go down and see the, how the battle goeth and take these things to your brother. And uh, that's what he did. You know, uh, if he hadn't been obedient, he would never even have seen these events happen. If you're not obedient, you're never going to be in a position of success. If you're not obedient, you know what? Another thing is you may never risk your safety. See, we always want to think about the success side of it, don't we? But what about when God deliberately puts you in a situation when all you can do is trust Him? Uh, not, not every situation works out. Now, we, we would love that to be the case, but uh, as you grow in faith, you'll find again and again that's not the case, but it, it does grow your faith. And so in verse 35, the Bible says, Excuse me, verse 34. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. Now, I don't know if these were two separate instances, or these two beasts came together, but I, I want you to see this, that uh, myself, and I think you would too, if it was already in the lion's mouth, I'd give up. I mean, that one's down, right? Protect the remaining ones. No, no. That wasn't what David thought it ought to be done. So when do you write off something as a defeat? I think that's the first thing you need to answer for yourself. When is it going too far? And, you know, I have to believe, and if I understand the Word of God, that never happens. Now, we think it happens, but in the, in, the, in the power of the Almighty, that's an impossibility, is it not? And so the, the lamb, and I would think he was chewing on his way down, uh, I bet the little thing was probably uh, bleeding and yelling out, and, uh, but David didn't count it off. Isn't it a wonderful, wonderful thing that God did not write you off? Uh, I, I, as many times he probably should have broke me off, but he did because he had a plan. So we see this situation that the Lord God put David in, and uh, the line was good as a write-off in man's eye, but notice what uh, he did. And when he, meaning the line, rose against me, meaning David, I caught him by the beard and smote him and slew him. Now you think about the courage of this little uh, boy, and from what I understand, probably when these things he heard uh, occurred, he was 15 or 16, he grabbed that lion's beard and smote him. Well, I'm assuming he stayed because that's all he had, and he went directly in an impossible battle. Now I ask you, what's different about David than you? Now, he had a very common, routine job, and God put him in a very desperate situation. You know what? Things likely to happen to you. Now, uh, you don't expect uh, delivering the mail that there could be danger, but there can be. You, you don't expect your routine job to have opportunity for witness, but there is. And, and many times we write all that off as, as nothing more than routine circumstance. But can you imagine the courage it took 
from a 15-year-old kid to grab the mane of a lion and kill him like this. You know what? That's a supernatural thing, is it not? That's faith that, I mean, after 53 years, I'm, I'm almost 40 years older than when this occurred, and I can't imagine that much faith. Now, I will say this. Part of the reason is I've never seen it. I've not seen it in other men. Have you? I, I've not seen anybody that would just walk out and face the beast. You know what? Every day of your life you face the beast whether you know it or not. And we as the Lord's people need to understand that and, and understand the opposition that we face. And so David reminds Saul of a previous victory. Look at yourself this morning. Remind yourself of a previous victory. Do you have any? I don't know uh, about you, but I know God's given me victory over victory over victory. And you know what? What, what we ought to do with them is feast on them. Hmm. It, it'll, it'll make you ready for the next one around. You know what? It's easy to talk of victory, but what about when there's nothing in that cabinet to eat and all that the, is in the refrigerator is cool air, and then you're dependent on what God would have you to do. See, that's where victory begins, when the impossibility is right there on you, and, 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 and you have to simply depend on God. And that's exactly this impossible situation with the line. Verse 36, and the servant slew both the lion and the bear. So again, was this a single episode? Now, I don't know, but would it be, would it be scary enough to face the lion? But what about if the bear was there too? See, you know what that tells me? You're going to face more than one enemy at a time. Sometimes there's going to be two. Sometimes there's going to be three. And you know what? All I can tell you is to do like David and run and face them with everything that you have. That, that, that's how the victory is won. And you say, uh, Brother Larry, I don't have anything. Well, I'll tell you what, dear friend, I don't believe that. Uh, he equips us for what we need. Now, David didn't have much, but he was equipped with what he needed. You know, you know what the problem is there? We think and we rely on things that we see will bring the victory. Not what God will bring the victory with, but what we think will bring the victory. Uh, I'll say this, use what you have. Uh, have confidence in God and use what you have. And the Lord will bless it greatly. Uh, certainly we don't need... <laughs> We don't need the armor of Saul. What we need is the belief, the confidence, the faith of David. Uh, verse 37. And David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. Now, I want you to notice a couple of things for first. He, again, he is reminding himself and telling Saul of previous victories, getting ready for the day. You know what? When you get in this situation, remind yourself of previous victories. You say, well, I don't have any. Well, the Lord saved you. That's a great and wonderful victory. You have a nature that hates God and he makes it into one that loves God. That's a, that's a victory. Amen. You say, I don't have anything else. Well, you got up and you breathed fresh air this morning. You, you know what makes me appreciate air? And a lot of people say, oh, I took the breath of life this morning. Well, praise God if you understand that. But when you have an asthma attack and you can't get breath, I guarantee you the next time around you'll thank God for it and you'll mean it. So you have that, had your family, got in the vehicle, and was able to drive to church and didn't have to walk through the rain. See, that's victory after victory after victory, is it not? Mm -hmm. And yet we, we count it almost as nothing. And so we see that David, uh, he, he 
recognized victories when they occurred in his life, and that built confidence in God. You know what? I have confidence God is able to do whatever seemeth good unto himself. Do you? Uh, David had confidence that the, uh, that the giant Goliath would be in his hand by the end of the day. Do you have confidence in your ministry? Do you have confidence that the Lord will add into his church as he sees fit? That's what the Bible teaches, is it not? Mm -hmm. Do you have confidence that he's still using you? Somebody's watching me. So David placed his confidence in God by experience. Mm -hmm. He, he learned time and time and time again that his confidence was not in himself, but rather the Almighty. And we understand and know the life of David time and time and time again. There was victory after victory. Even when his own son, Absalom, come up against him, there was a victory given. And so we find that doesn't start with playing church. It doesn't start with going through an empty routine. It, do, it doesn't start. There has to be a testing of your faith. And I remember when Brother Jackson first got over here, and he asked me, he said, do y'all have any tornadoes here? And I said, well, yeah, we got some. And this has been the worst year for tornadoes that I have seen almost in my whole life. Uh, that was the time of testing, was it not? And uh, that, <laughs> that just gives you experience, doesn't it? It makes you trust God when nothing else will work. Uh, uh, of course, that tornado hit Diane and Junior's too, and I couldn't help but chuckle. Donna's grandfather, Carlin Sr., told her dad that you don't need to buy that house because a tornado hit there. And he said, I guess Daddy was right. <laughs> And it was almost 50 years between them. See, that'll build confidence, will it not? When, when the storm is on and you have to run to your closet, who else are you going to depend on? And so we find that the reason David had so much confidence in the Almighty is because he experienced, and you and I will have to experience trials to understand victory. In other words, we want to live in victory when there is no battle. That is an impossibility, is it not? If you're not in the battle, you're not going to claim the victory. And so David had learned this by experience, and you will too. Verse uh, 39, excuse me, verse 38, And Saul armed David with his armor. So what are you going to need for this battle? Well, what's going to be your equipment? What, what are you going to possess that will help you in the battle? Now, there are some things that you have to know. We'll see in a moment that David ends up refusing this from, his, uh, from, his, uh, from Saul, from his leader. He says, I haven't earned them. I haven't proved them is the exact quotation. And so you have to use what you know. Now, in that lap of yours or beside you this morning, there's a book that's all, the only stave that you need. Mm -hmm. But you've got to know how to use it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you, you, know, uh, you know how false doctrine comes up? Because people's got a stave and they don't know how to use it. I knew, I've known good, uh, I won't say strong Baptists. Because if they had it, they wouldn't have been influenced. But I've known Baptist people that became Russellites. Hmm. And you know why? They didn't know how to use that equipment that God gave them. Mm -hmm. And I'll say even more, to understand equipment, you have to get into it. And you have to know the crooks, and you have to know the bends and the work to get it done. And so... Uh, you can't just pick up someone else's and go build a ministry on what someone else has done. That's an impossibility. And so we see that David understood that. 
Verse 39, and David girded his sword upon his armor, and he assuaged or got assayed or got ready to go, attempted to go, for he uh for uh, assayed or declined going, excuse me, for he had not proved it. In other words, he didn't know how it worked. He didn't know the ins and outs of it. So you go with what you have. If you and you know what? This is what I have found from the word of God. If I want more, I'll receive it. But it, it doesn't come by just showing up for preaching time. It comes by self-study of this blessed old book. And the reason that David didn't take this huge armor, and, and if you if you can think of it, not only had he not earned it, it didn't fit him. What what do you know about Saul? Bible says he's head and shoulders above everybody else. You remember? That's why they picked him. It wasn't the will of God. It never was the will of God. But he, they picked him on the physical characteristics. Now, you think about it, to be head and shoulders above me, and I'm almost an average height man. I'm 5'9". Five, five, I used to be 5'10", but I'm shrinking now. Um, but to be head, to have someone's shoulders to be above my head, they have to be over seven foot tall. And how how tall was Goliath? About ten foot tall, right? Uh, said uh, he was measured by eight by eighteen inch segments. And so you think about this huge armor, a man that's seven seven foot tall as Saul was. I'm sure his breeches was like this. And here's little David, seventeen year old boy. And I imagine I was taller, I, David was, and at that, at that age, they engulfed him. He didn't fit him. You know where you need to work where it fits you. That, that's where your work needs to be. Now, it, you know, and churches are, have personalities. That's what I've seen over the years. Uh, I, I once said they have personalities, and that's why they're for, uh, referred to in the female gender. And... Uh, uh, but I don't. I think there's churches I wouldn't work at. Don't you think? Mm -hmm. That I just would not be what they needed, and certainly they wouldn't be what I need. Mm -hmm. You know what? That's okay. Mm -hmm. That's fine. And David hadn't earned it, and he was not comfortable with it. He just didn't know how to use it. And, and so we find that that is true in many, many circumstances. And so I want you to see David did the right thing and he declined it. You know, the hardest thing you will ever do is decline a church that your flesh wants you, wants you to be at. Many years ago, very, very fine church. I love those people to death up in, uh, up in uh, Ohio. Outside of Dayton, wonderful church there. Brother Clark was there for years. And they called me to be their pastor. And I just couldn't go. I did not have the leadership of God. But I wanted to go. I wanted to be there. But it wasn't the right fit. You see that? Just because you want something doesn't mean it's the right fit. And so he discards this armor... Because he wanted to depend on God. He did not want to fit, depend on, uh, on an armor that didn't even fit on him. If he gained the victory, he already said the victory is the Lord. You know who will give you a victorious life? And listen, that don't have to be a situation like David endured. Just living in victory, All the only key there is to it is depending on God. I was thinking the other day, this has not been the best year for me. But you know what? I'm depending on God. Mm. Everything that happened in my life, every person who died in my family, God was the author of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I just have to give it to Him and live in victory. You know what a lot of people do? Boo -hoo 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 -hoo. You know what? If the Lord doesn't return, every one of us is going to die. We need to live in victory. Man, the devil desperately loves to keep us in defeat, doesn't he? You know how he does that? He discourages us. 
What are y'all doing? I, I'm, I'm sure y'all thought when the tornado was going over, what are we doing in this stupid flat county in West Tennessee? But you know what? Live in victory. Come out on the other side. Uh, uh, you know, it's amazing what our God can do. I knew more about the tornado here in Stewart County before Donna did. Uh, and I started making some phone calls. Say, okay, what's going on? How's my family? Live in victory. Live in victory. Don't, don't take up someone else's routine. Just live in victory. That, that is where we need to be this morning is living in victory. Now notice in verse 40, and he, meaning David, took his staff, not the big staff, not the big weapon. He took his staff, which is just a thing you kind of nudge sheep along with to keep them in the right line, to move them in the right direction. It's no real weapon at all, but you know what? He knew how to use it. That's what he needed. He took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones. Now, a lot of people will postulate why he took five, it's the number of grace and a lot of different things. And that's fine. But you know why I think he did it? It's because God told him to. He didn't need but one, but he took five. Now, I want you to see the description of the stones. It says there's five smooth stones. Now, what is difficult to find, and I grew up on Cross Creek down here at Carlisle, it's very difficult to find a smooth stone there. Now, you will every once in a while, but it's rare. Most of them are like, you know, weird shapes and sharp, uh, I guess is the best word, and not very smooth and rounded. Now, up in East Tennessee, and I can't remember when we were up there, while we were up there, we were, yeah, we were walking around, and I, I looked at this stream, and every stone in it was smooth and round. And I got to looking, and the water was rough, and, and those stones were always tumbling and moving about, and that's how they got smooth. See, you don't get smooth, and you don't get strong by sitting on your backside. Mm -hmm. now, it, it, it takes effort. God had prepared these stones since time began, and he picked them up, and they were the very ones. In other words, don't, don't ignore happenings in your life, and don't write them up as per chance. God is preparing things around you for something. Who knows what it might be, but he's preparing us for something within his, within his ability, within, within his plan. And he, took up five, and he took up his staff in his hand, chose him five uh, smooth stones out of the brook, and put them in a shepherd's bag. Again, all items that he knew to use. Now, just to give an example, who has held the hand of the dying? Am I the only one here? I can do that. It's sad, and you can pray with them, and you feel the life move out of them, and you can't go cold. Uh, I will guarantee you there's nobody in here right now chomping at the bit to do that. I would do it. You know why? It's because that's how the Lord made me. And I'm okay to do that. I know what to do. And every one of us, that, that was his thing. He had a shepherd's bag. He knew how to use it and he knew what was in it. Other things I don't know how to do. Please don't let me cut your hair. Right? <laughs> But I know a man that can. You see what I'm saying? Use the experience that he placed you in. Mm -hmm. And he'll give you the equipment. He'll give you the equipment to, to share the gospel. And not only that, he'll give you the equipment when the battle comes. And so he, he used items that he understood and knew, part of his everyday stuff. And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David, and the, and the man that bare the shield went before him. Now, I want you to see that there, there was double trouble ahead of him. 
That's why I say I don't know if the bear and the lion were separate instances or they, they were the same time or, or what happened, but now I know for sure he's facing two enemies at the same time. You know, you may be doing the very same thing before the sun goes down today. Instead of facing one enemy, be facing two. His arm bearer was out there and he was out there. He, you know what? Um, he ever thought that Goliath wasn't big as bad as he thought he was. If he was, then why did he need somebody to carry his shield? You see what I'm saying? Uh, your problem may not be as big and bad as you think it is. Face it. Uh, look at what God has given you. And so we find that, um, <laughs> that the situation looked bleak, to say the very least. And the Philistine looked about and saw David, and he disdained him disdained him. In other words, he couldn't believe it. He, it made him sick. When you're disdained, it's, it's like, really? Is that really what you could come up with? And that's what the devil wants you to believe, that you are no match for him. That's what the problem with many people today, they don't have confidence in their God. The rest of that verse, for he was but a youth. Now again, the way that I understand the Jewish culture, the best I understand, you're not a real man until you're about 40. And up to that time, you're considered a youth. From the time you uh, are about 13. But the best historical, and you take that for what it's worth, he was about 16 or 17 when these occurred. Uh, I wish I could show you pictures of me at 16 or 17, weighing about 119 pounds and trying to go up against Goliath. That, that's where he was. How did he do that? How did he face that unbelievable odd? It's because he knew the Lord. It's because he had, it's because he had confidence in, in exactly who the Lord was and he understood the deliverance that comes with trusting him. And so this man huh, is almost mad that they would even do such a thing. Verse 43, And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Now, I want you to see one of the fatal errors that uh, Goliath made was to cuss a man of God by idols that um, they were no gods. They were nothing. But you, you know who took offense to that? The Almighty. Now, you know what? I really believe this. After this moment, he was as good as dead. I believe the problem had finally been solved. See, you're going to face situations just like... And not only will they call to their gods, they'll make fun of your God. You know what the most hysterical thing to be in is? That God is sovereign in all situations. Have you ever had a, had a what's seemingly a horrible situation and you just kind of say, well, Lord, take care of it and almost be chuckled at? Uh, it happens a lot. Yeah. Um, but you know what? God's able. And, and so we find he's in this unbelievable situation, and we find his enemy is blaspheming God. You, you know why the situation is in our country today when men are marrying men and women are marrying women and they're being defended by the government? They, they're defying the God of heaven, and they're worshiping their gods. That, that's why they do the things that they do. But notice, verse 44, And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and the beast of the field. Now, that's a, that's a pretty big threat coming from a 10 foot, 10 foot tall man. Would you go? Now, was that why he went? No. He wasn't going there to please the idea and the invitation of, of a rebel. He went there because he already knew that it was the plan of God. Where are you going to go? What's going to be your plan? 
And when the time comes, are you going to go? It's, it, get, it gets very difficult sometimes. And I'm just saying this from the flesh, and you know it is too, to be obedient, isn't it? If we be honest, it's difficult to be obedient at times. But I want you to see David understood God's plan, and he did it. And you know what? I believe he put the outcome in God's hand. <laughs> he already knew what God was going to do, and he believed it. He, he, he had confidence that God was going to do it. Verse 45, Then said David to the Philistine, now, you get the picture, and, and probably David may have been five foot six, five foot seven. So this giant was nearly as tall again as David, and he answers him. Have you ever answered the opponent? Have you ever said, no, that's not right. This is what the Bible says. That's what David was doing. See, uh, old Goliath gave him a pretty grand synopsis of what was about to happen, didn't he? But David said, no, no. You listen to me. This is what's going to happen. And, and how could David do that boldly? He believed God. You know how you can be boldly successful? Just believe God. Yeah. Just take confidence in who he is and the strength that's behind him. Listen, if we believe he's sovereign, we have to believe he's sovereign in all things, do we not? And certainly he is. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear, with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied or defied, excuse me. Now, do you get mad when God's truths are defied? I think that's pretty fair, don't you? David was. Mm -hmm. You get upset when people tell you uh, that they're dependent on their baptism? I don't hate them, and, but listen, I, I will tell them the error I will tell them the problem. Right. But I want you to see that David says, this is what you, it's not just coming out against me, a little shepherd boy. You're defying the God of all heavens. You are defying the Almighty. And with that, yeah, I'm upset about it. Verse 46, this day will the Lord deliver thee unto mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thy head from thee. Now, can you imagine what a scene that must have been? And they're standing down there together, screaming back and forth to each other. And he said, oh boy, I'm taking your head off before the day goes down. That's having some confidence in God, is it not? What's your, what's your level of confidence in the Almighty? What, what's, I'll ask you a better one than that. What's going to waver it? Because if, if you go on long enough, your faith will be wavered. There will be a challenge to it, just like your Goliath. Yeah. And when it happens, my dear friend, you be ready. You be ready for what's ahead because it's a necessary if you're going to serve, if you're going to come out on the victorious side. I will give the carcass of the host of the Philistines this day and to the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth and all the earth, what? May know that there is a God in Israel. Now, I want you to see this is the one you have to be very careful of, young men. Three preacher boys in here this morning. Don't do it for yourself. Ever. Why did he do it? For the glory of God. Mm -hmm. You ever got a sermon together and think, oh man, this is going to be a stem winder. And got up there and fell flat on your face. I have. And you know why? I was going in the wrong reason. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> it'll happen every time. So I want you to see that he didn't so much want to be the big guy on campus he, I don't think he was even concerned about surviving through the battle. He wanted to glorify God. 
And that should be the desire of everyone under the sound of my breath this morning is that you would desire to glorify God with whatever breath you have, with whatever strength you have, with whatever skill you have, that you would wish to glorify God in it. And with that, you'll come out on top like David every time. You'll come out and you will be the victor. Verse 47. And all this assembly, that means God's people and the Philistines, all this assembly shall know that the Lord saith, saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he and he will give you unto our, unto our hands. Now, David understood the, what made a battle tick. Do you? Now, you ever wonder why you end in such a situation? How did I get here? But listen, I assure you this, it wasn't by accident. God put you there for a reason. Verse 48. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted. Now, I want you to see this incredible thing because, again, it shows the confidence that David had in God. You have this 10-foot man headed toward you, and, you know, it would be our, our thing to kind of move away from him, but he went at him with everything that he had, and he got his little sling, and he threw it. You know what? We need to run right into the battle. We don't need to be, we don't need to be candid. There's no need in us to be fearful. We need to go to battle. Look around, and uh, this will be an unusual day, and I guess after a meal, it'll still be kind of the same. But have you ever gone by these other groups here in Dover or down at Paris, and listen, they're packed out like you wouldn't believe? Kind of discouraging if you let the flesh discourage you, doesn't it? But <laughs> run right into it. Mm -hmm. Run right into it. Face it with everything you got. Uh, go right toward the problem. If you have a spiritual problem in your life, the thing to do is to run straight forward and, 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 and get it <laughs> and bring the victory by the power of God. And so he ran right toward the battle. And David put his hand in his bag and he took thence a stone and he slung it and smote the and smote the Philistine in his forehead, and the stone sunk into his forehead, and he fell upon his face to the earth. Now, use what he had. You use what you have. He's like, well, Brother Larry, I don't have nothing. I don't I don't believe that. I don't believe it for a moment. Every one of us are given intrinsic gifts. To glorify God. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is, it's not because we don't have them. It's because we don't use them. Now, I'm not a very good marksman. I can shoot a gun, and I'm not afraid of guns. But I'm not that good with guns. Why? I don't practice. How much do you practice? Mm. What do you, how do you use your talents for the Almighty? Uh... What do you do with your talents? Is it just a way to make money? Or is it a way to glorify God? Verse 50, so David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Now don't forget this, because I used to have to reread this a couple of times. And then maybe he wasn't David, maybe he just conked him out until he cut his head off. No, no, the, day, the, the victory came from what, with what David had. Now, why did he cut his head off? Was it to make him sure he was double dead? No. That was to show that he had authority over the problem. Now, you know the rest of this, these events, when they saw that huh, their big devil man was down, the whole army of Israel converged on that group, and the Philistines went running. You want to see that the devil and his bunch of imps go running? Fighting <laughs> victory. Be the, be the one on top. Be the one that gets God's plan and sticks to it. And the next time you see the bear coming, because he will, remember there's a purpose behind it. Remember that there, that difficulty is to give you a skill to, to, to use in future battles. 
and don't cower away. Run straight to it. Mm -hmm. uh, get, get the victory that God would have you to have, and, and huh, you'll be greatly blessed for it. So I ask you this morning, and you might not be an either, but I sincerely doubt it, but are you at the battle? Are you facing the enemy? Have you got him scoped out? Now, if you read this whole chapter, uh, the men of Israel had already scoped him out. That's how we know he was ten spans, I think is how it's put. How tall he was. Hmm. Uh, they had scoped the problem out. Dear friend, whatever's in front of you, you scope the problem out. And then run at it with everything you have. If you don't know what's in your bag, check it out. Uh, see what's in there. If you need some more stones, go get them. We need to be in the business of spreading the gospel and winning the victory. No matter how many or how few you have. I'm not going to say who it is because it's neither here nor there, but I know of a group in Paris. And I was talking to this woman the other day. They had over 450 in their attendance. You know what? I think a lot, of it? Because I'm telling you, they don't believe truth. So I'd have to consider that as a Goliath. What you? But God's able. He's able. And we just need to run toward it. You want the victory? Run straight at it.